In Gallant Subframes Part 2, I exploded the entire undercarriage of this all-wheel drive Gallant with all-wheel steering for restoration. I called it a subframe restoration, but you can see it's a whole lot more than that. Picking right up where we left off, I have a pile of parts that need new bushings. Lots of people dread these jobs, but it just takes the right tooling to make it really easy. A bushing press kit's necessary whether or not you use this screw-type C-clamp thing in the box that you'll find, but... You know, one way or the other, the hydraulic press is going to end up being your best friend on these jobs. For most bushings, you can get away with just using sockets that it, you have around your shop to press bushings out and to capture them easily like this. But sometimes they have metal sleeves with flanges on them that prevent you from having anything practical to brace against. And that was a problem that I did encounter with the sockets that we have around the shop on my parts. Sometimes they get stuck too. And this is how you fix that. The rear suspension arms are replaceable service parts. If you have a problem that you can't find parts for, you replace the whole unit. For that reason, I'm not going to bother doing any finishing work beyond just painting these. And in order for that paint to stick, they need to be degreased and prepared for painting. I could do this two different ways, of course. I could use, of course, Scotch-Brite pads and a die grinder like this, which, you know, I did at first to get a feel for what's under that surface rust. But ultimately, media blasting these parts ends up being a lot more efficient of an option from a time and energy standpoint. It might not take as long, but it does use an awful lot of air. Depending on what media you're using, you can also cause harm to certain parts or make a mess that's particularly difficult to clean up. So I'm insulating all of these parts from the worst of it with many layers of tape first. There's still grease in these boots and I don't want to mix that with the blasting media. This time, I'm smart enough to use the vacuum extractor. It's a lesson not worth learning a second time. Plus, you'll be able to see a whole lot better while you're working. I'm just using BHT roll bar and chassis paint because it's self-priming high gloss black that's very durable. It should hold up for years, and in the event that a joint completely fails later on down the road, there are aftermarket solutions for these arms available that are adjustable, and something that I can consider at that time. For now, I just want to make sure that I can end the corrosion and put it all back together to prove that it all works together still. The front subframe is in incredible condition. Like most components, it's in better shape than my GSX. The areas with light surface rust all quickly disappeared with the Scotch-Brite treatment. I don't need to take this all the way down to bare metal because I don't plan to be the one painting this. I just want to get to know it all better first. I also have to remove the bushings where it secures to the body because those will all be replaced with the polyurethane units that I showcased in the last video. The factory subframe bushings are just rubber bushings with no metal sleeves in them, pressed into the hole with an interference fit. But after three decades, they can get good and stuck, and it's a bit awkward part to balance on a hydraulic press, you know? It's, it's a big thing. So for this, and you've seen it here before, just take it outside and burn them out. Elevate it enough to get good airflow, light it, and wait. Fire does all the work for you. It just takes about a half hour if you light it and leave it alone. Less if you poke at it and keep burning it with a torch. It's only bad if the bushing has an outer sleeve on it because you'd still have to knock those sleeves out of the hole afterwards, but on these subframe bushings, you don't have to. Like I said, I've covered all this before. We did this on Robert's Boosted Beaver. And I didn't have a 1G yet, so we did the job on his car to cover the topic. You know, I wonder how he's doing today. It's a beautiful night for some s'mores. <laughs> it's been a long time since we've done this. Uh, it's been about 10 years, I think, right? 10 years, man. Well, a lot's happened in that time. I got a shop. I got a bunch of projects. No, I had all of those when we were <laughs> hanging out and doing this last. I still had them all. So what else has changed? You got more hair. I got a bald spot. <laughs> I gained a kid. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, more than one. First time of the time we started this? Yeah, Mason wasn't here either. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice black rubber tent there. Oh, I got to catch up, man. You're getting too far ahead of me. I want to be able to enjoy these together. We've got a welding rod sitting around, a couple of bushings to burn out, a pack of chocolate and some marshmallows. Good night with some friends and to do some car things. Yeah, I appreciate you driving all the way up here just to install these bushings and return the favor from all those years ago, you know. Oh, I couldn't miss the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. You know what else has changed? What's that? You can walk around your car inside your shop now. Yeah, I can walk under it. <laughs> oh, man.
man, uh, it's in the crisp air and the smell of vulcanized rubber burning. Got up yet? Oh, oh no! Got a little crispy there. Yeah, mine's a, mine's a crispy critter. I think it's crispy enough. Oh yeah, mine's about to pull through. Yeah. This is way more difficult. Remember the last time we did this, I dropped mine on the ground? And picked it up and ate it anyway. You can't have enough vitamin rubber in your diet. It's like a tire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised that you eat this as disciplined as you are. I mean, look at you. You're watching your calories. You got a, you got a half of a s'mores. You need to do a whole one. I mean, look. It takes a lot of work to end up looking like you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll just, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll stick with my half one. All right. <laughs> I heard that. Mm. Mm. Oh man. In here. Pretty good. Mm-hmm. The rubber really adds a nice layer. Yeah. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Well. As soon as this sugar gets to my bloodstream, I'm gonna be ready to put these bushings in. <laughs> Man, thank you for keeping this tradition alive. All right, that's enough of that silliness. We went ahead and installed the bushings in the arms and continued poking fun at each other with the expected dialogue that was prevalent all through the first series of videos where we did this same work. I linked them in the description below. We covered lots of stuff together from drive shaft rebuilds, carrier bearings, full subframe bushing replacements, lower control arms, DIY suspension parts, and even the tow eliminator installation. Aside from watching me glaze over only some of what we did before, the point that I can add regarding doing this job is that you'll need a bearing press, the bushing driver kit, and at least two base plate fixtures on a 1G DSM like anything to make this job really, really easy. Most of them are just as easy as this one to deal with. The ones that are tricky are still easy, you just need the right rigging. Press them out or burn them out. The torch is really unnecessary, but we love a good fire. All of the bushings in your set are made for specific joints. Sometimes they only fit one way, making things really easy. You see, the arm has a lip pressed in with one direction, and the bushing has a groove to receive it. That's how you know which way it goes. The outer bushing is cut the opposite way to mate up and support every single surface all the way around the mating points when it's pressed together. But first, lubricate the heck out of everything before you put it together. The lube serves at least three purposes. It keeps your suspension from squeaking, it keeps the moisture out, and it makes assembly easier. If you're struggling, you didn't use enough. Grease the bushings and the pins. Heck, grease the hole too. Push the pin through and you're done with that one. You can order the wrong bushing kit or you can fail to follow the instructions, but if you don't, then you can't put the thing together wrong. It makes for a really tidy and rigid connection wherever you install these. This last upper arm is rinse repeat. The rear arms are the easiest ones to do on the entire car. It doesn't matter if you have the subframe out of the car or not, just using a socket and a press you can do these bushings in an hour. Add whatever other process you're going to do, you know, fine. But this is all I'm doing for the rear arms for now. None of the ball joints on any of them are bad. I've got some cracked boots, and if I can find replacements, I can swap those out and repack them. If not, I'll do better when they're replaced. But pretty quickly, that knocks out two-thirds of the rear subframe bushing kit. Where it comes to 1G front knuckles, things do get a little bit awkward. A lot comes together here, the parts are put together in a specific order, and most of what's on it is hard to rig up on a press because it's very awkwardly shaped. Pressed in parts include sensors, bearings, hubs, and seals. So the dust shields are fragile and in the way of most everything that you're doing, and it has this big awkward leg hanging off of one side. I have to press everything apart, and I don't want to destroy these ABS sensors, so that's why you're seeing me fighting these things right now. After they were removed, I ran out of all the right rigging options for pressing these things apart and took a trip across town. You can tell what my day looks like. I totally crashed Abe's crib and derailed his, his progress. Mmm. It's all my fault. My sleep right here. 
So we're going to rip the hubs out of these spindles. Of course, I get here and we still end up using sockets and extensions to do this. We just had a better selection to work with. That takes care of the front hub, and now there's just a bearing to have to press out of it once I take that ABS ring off. As for the knuckle, there's still a bearing to have to press out. This particular bearing is still good. Oh yeah! Head and drive across town and come use your sockets to press this out with. How about that? Alright. <laughs> we removed the inner snap ring and then used a bushing driver, a millimeter smaller than the outer bearing race, to press it out no matter what it felt like doing. I don't care what the part is, if it's on an axle, if I do one side, then I do the other. As long as everything was assembled correctly to begin with, then I know that the forces that wore out one side also affected the other, or that the part's practical lifespan has already been lived. And I don't want to go back, to, you know, in there a week later and have to replace the same part on another side. Good catch. All right. That one was a bad bearing for sure. Nice and rusty on the inside. Look at that crusty, crunchy stuff. So, new wheel bearings and seals it is all yep. the way around. Glad that one's gone. I had two deficits to have to work with. One, I only had one deck plate, making the bearings impossible to press out. And the other one was a sleeve socket or a cut piece of pipe that was the right size and thickness to press the brand new lower control arm bushings out of these brand new Dorman arms without crushing them. The bushing the Dorman units use has a metal sleeve that protrudes and it prevented any socket we had in the shop from fitting it. All of my sockets were too thick, and it was a good excuse to drive across town, eat some good barbecue together, talk about JDM imports, visit some DSM projects. You see how this works? Everybody wins and has a good time when they do this together. There you go. Nice and clean. Yay, brand new bushing. Goes straight in the trash. <laughs> Every single part on this floor still needs restoration, and I have a plan for all of it. It's a brilliant plan. First, I take all the brake pads out of the brakes, and the guides, the chunks of rust, bang that stuff out, and then put them in my truck. The plan for the rear subframe is almost exactly like the front one. Clear off all the surface rust and get a better inspection of all the metal around the welds and the places where it was a problem. You know, see, see where the rust was and follow it. This is just an inspection. Stuff like this is too big for the blasting cabinet, and the rear is always going to be rustier than the front on these old cars. So I just want to make sure I'm doing the right thing by putting it in the back of my truck. The rear trailing arms both still have the axle shafts and the cups bolted through them, and there's a special tool for this, but I just used the wheel to hold the hub still while spinning the nut off with an air impact. I tried to rig the first one up in the press to show you how to press the axle shaft out of the bearings, but the second I pressed it lightly against the cylinder it just fell out. Now I didn't even get a chance to move the camera, so given that I just tapped the other one out with a small hammer. I put the nut on it to prevent any damage to the threads, of course. Here's the stub axle. The rear axle hubs use the same locking 27mm nut to secure the cups onto the axle stub as all the other ones on the drive shaft and the lobro joint, just so you know. This one has a damaged outer seal that doesn't seem to have affected it or the bearing. That aluminum gear is the ABS reluctor wheel, and it's also pressed on, making replacing all of that just that much more fun later. Next on the rear trailing arms, there's the brake dust shields, or the splash guards, whichever you prefer to call them. What I like to call these when they still have factory paint on them is a rare commodity. That's just in time for preservation. These usually take a whole lot of abuse, and brakes tend to boil off all the water and keep the salt. 
Another part that I need to remove is the rear trailing arm toe connectors. The rear trailing arm is what applies all the force from the rear tires to the frame of the car, and 99% of that force from the rear is applied through these two bush toe link connectors. There's probably some kind of fancy tool that threads onto this thing with a through bolt and makes removing it a piece of cake, but I'm just showing you that it's possible to do it with a hammer and a screwdriver because you probably don't have that tool either. It's thick cast iron, so you're not going to hurt it. Okay, freeze. This is the joint where the rear trailing arm flexes in order to allow rear steering to work. Rear steering on a Gallant VR4 uses hydraulic force to bend these joints using the rear rack and therefore allow up to 1.5 degrees of toe adjustment. Every first generation all-wheel drive Mitsubishi thing uses this same exact joint, whether it has all-wheel steering or not. So think about what happens when you double the horsepower or do more than the car was designed to hold back here. On hard launches, you might get some deflection in the rear wheels that affects your traction. Well, you know, I trolled a part in the last video that was completely out of place with the mission of this car's restoration that deletes this joint on all-wheel drive first-generation cars. Obviously, I can't use it here if I'm fixing that. And that's why you were being trolled. Sometimes I buy parts just to intimidate projects into cooperating. It's the same sort of approach you've seen me use before with stuck bolts. We don't need hubs, stubs, cups, or tow links where we're going. We really don't need those outer seals or bearings either because my restoration solution once again is to put them in my truck. There's probably some other things that I could, oh yeah, the sway bars. They still got the end links on them and of course the one end that had to be cut off on one side was every bit as bad on the other end too. None of the other ones put up a fight but this one. And now I can put these in my truck too. This is likely going to be the first one of many loads that I approach this way and I have many reasons for doing this. There's a joy to be had in becoming a part of every single process, I admit. And learning how to do every little thing, you know, but it's impractical for you to ever believe for a second that you are everything. If your idea is more important than you are, then there's something bigger to be said about supporting the hardworking people who were born from the community and who have dedicated their livelihoods to serving it and making it better. Your support here, whether it's watching, subscribing, and especially contributing to Patreon to blow the scale of these projects up, all of it is helping their economy. I'm proud to give to people whose entire working lives have been dedicated to supplying us with specialty items and services. I'm here not just because Justin helped me sort out the Glyptol ordeal. I'm here because I appreciate that it was his own frustrations with painting his own DSM parts every few years because paint doesn't last very long. It takes maintenance to keep it looking fresh. He didn't just learn how to do it. He's earned his livelihood helping thousands of enthusiasts customize their parts. And it's an honor to involve him in this Galant's restoration, you know? I'm sure that many of my viewers have his work in their cars. So they know that he's been to dozens of shootouts, and when I called him to ask what state I should have all these parts in, he told me to just put it all in my truck. And I'm pretty sure that that might be different for all the rest of you, though, you know? He knows me well enough that I've got a penchant for cleaning things and taking them apart already. But I'll get these back with a nice, friendly, forever coating on them. Detective coating's how I'm doing it. Meanwhile, back at the shop. I want to close out that last third of the rear subframe bushing set. The tow link connector bushings. They're a little awkward, but you can caveman these things right out, sleeves and all. Oh no, I... Not cool! I did not... Don't try this at home. That's what I was saying. Don't try that at home. There's the pickle. It's almost out. Just got a little more to go. One of the bushings was cracked, so it would have needed replacement anyways, or soon at least. Doing this doesn't delete the movement of the steering assembly at all. This is actually a flexible molded rubber joint with steel bits inside of it. It still flexes even though I'm installing a rigid bushing on the end of it. Next, they were sandblasted and coated with two coats of chassis and roll bar paint. While these things dry, I figured I'm going to work on these brand new front lower control arm bushing sets. Might as well get these things out of the way, right? It just so happens that when I said that those brand new clean bushings go right in the trash, I was wrong. I meant that they go right in the fire. Turns out you need the outer sleeve for the poly bushing insert. It rides inside the sleeve, so I'm burning the pin and the bushing out so that I can press a sleeve right back in there again. No, I'm not kidding. Look, I didn't need this bushing, alright? And I'm not cooking my brand new control arms. Sadly, this one isn't big enough for a s'mores. It's only about the size of a marshmallow. 
After scraping out all the residue and rinsing it with carb cleaner, I blasted it and grabbed a round file because I really messed this one up trying to press it out using all the wrong stuff. If you have to reuse the sleeve for your bushing, always check all the edges of it really good anyway all the way around. Sleeve or not, really. Pressing them in and out can leave burrs that wear the bushing prematurely, so if you feel a burr or an edge around the sleeve like I caused here with the press, then smooth it out until you can't feel it with your finger anymore. Even though I nicked it real bad in two spots, it's going to be just fine. All of that happened just because the bushing I'm using needs the sleeve. Anyone could burn that one out without the press. But know that the whole control arm would have to be refinished afterwards because the fire will damage whatever paint or powder coating is on it. Usually not in the hole so much, but immediately all the way around it. So glad I pressed that whole thing out first because this brand new control arm is just so clean. Once you've properly prepared your hole, this lower control arm bushing is probably the easiest one to install. This one's got a rubber ring for one end, and I typically get less greasy putting it in prior to the installing that pin. You know, the flange on the sleeve and the flange of the bushing both face the front of the car. The rubber ring goes towards the back of the car. You can see it all right there. Clean and tidy, brand new front lower control arm with poly front bushing. Now for the rear front lower control arm bushing or the front rear. I know it sounds confusing, but really it's right. The only reason the box for the front lower control arm bushings is so big is because it has two gigantic bushings in it. These are just singular big old swole chunks of poly with a hole in them. It slides on and you're done. I might be putting it on right, or I might be doing it backwards. Easy enough to flip it if I've got it wrong, but that takes care of all four of the front control arm bushings. Now for the last third of that rear subframe set. There's only a pair of bushings left, and they belong to these tow link connectors. Not really a whole lot else to say about an installation that's so easy that you don't even need tools. You know everything I'm doing with this stuff by now. It feels really good to finally be installing parts and getting everything ready to go for when the subframes, knuckles, and brakes all come back. This is a welcome break from only buying things and taking stuff apart. Having two whole boxes of bushing sets finished, and having all six of the arms refinished and refurbished or replaced is a huge head start for assembly. Everything looks brand new again. Well, mostly. Lots of people have grown to me about installing these bushings, but it's not the installation of the poly bushings that makes any of this hard to do at all. The hard part is accepting that in order for you to dig as deep as the inexpensive poly bushings, you'll end up having to address every single other flaw on every part and all the bush things are bolted to. You know, it's, you might create even more problems along your journey and you just gotta accept that. The bushings are cheap, but one of everything else isn't. So if you pay someone else to do these, be prepared to open your wallet. I think watching me go through all this might help you set your expectations. Speaking of expectations, I expect to reuse these things. Yeah, a little more force on that than I thought. Pretty, well, pretty good and preloaded. Let's do that again. They're rough. They're pink. They're not supposed to be pink. There's pink flaking off of them thanks to rust. They're old, but they have very low mileage. I have no desire to reinvent the wheel on these. There's a lot that I can't do because they're pressurized gas cylinders. And restoring their appearance doesn't actually have to involve repainting them. My biggest issue with these is rust potentially compromising them before their time. In addition to degreasing and power washing these things, I also spent a few hours by hand with the steel wire brush on every single surface, every nook and crevasse. This smoothed out all the rust spots, paint chips, and oxidation to leave me with what still looked pink. So after another vigorous buffing with mineral spirits to clean everything off, the wire brush loosened up. I took a different approach on this than I have employed everywhere else. I masked and clear coated them. I don't care if they're beat up, they're period correct, fully functional, adjustable struts that deserve to be used all the way up. If anything ever bad happens to them, well then I'll replace them with something newer and fancier, but I plan to put the 12-year parts hoard back to work. This coating will not only add a waterproofing layer to stop the rust, it turned them right back to their original red color again. And I knocked the vast majority of the ugly right off of them. And that's great for the strut bodies and the new H&R springs, but the rest of the hardware needs to keep appearances with all the other pristine refinished parts. The front upper strut parts are just as beat up, but also covered in undercoating overspray because they were here long before these struts ever even showed up. I'm taking advantage of the blasting cabinet opportunity to clean all of this stuff up the easy way. It doesn't take very long to get all that off down to the bare metal, just a slight bit longer because of the rubberized undercoating. It sort of repels the blasting media being that it's rubber. Boing. 
But after blasting these parts, I'm using the same gloss black paint selection that I started with on the arms and the other parts so that they all match. It's the same treatment the factory gave all of it new. It just looks a whole lot better today. Fresh paint. I did both sides to fully seal it and then masked and blasted the front strut mounts. Fortunately, there's a cap on them that seals the top side of the bearing from the blasting media, but I used a polyester tape treatment and degreased it and stuck it over the bottom side of the bearing to avoid contaminating the bearing while blasting everything else. With those closed up, I just gave them the same paint treatment, and it doesn't matter at all if there's overspray on the rubber. In fact, I want the rubber seam against the metal sealed up completely with the paint. And both my masking job and the studs on the protruding bearing on the bottom side allowed me to flip and paint both sides of it without distorting or smearing any of the wet paint. That's all the front strut parts that are made out of metal moving right along while that paint dries. The front hubs have still got the outer bearing race, a bunch of old grease, and the outer seal stuck in there real good, and you can't get any of that stuff off without removing the ABS ring from the back of the hub first. And I'll show you. Based on all the other 10 and 12 millimeter hardware behaviors, I took extra precautions not to break anything, and we'll never know if my efforts worked or not because I didn't break anything. I used a bearing knife to pinch between the seal and the bearing, and then took these parts over to the press to drive out the bearing race. This is the reason you had to take the ABS ring off. The bearing knife is probably bigger than the one I need to use, and it's more obvious on the next one, but the big bearing knife is a whole lot easier to rig up with big sockets so that you have ample clearance below the hub to press it out. It's big enough that you can clear the outer circumference of the flange for the wheel, but it's hard to get the big knife between the seal and the bearing compared to the smaller units because it's so thick. That's why I'm struggling with it here. I did knock all the wheel studs out of both hubs before masking the bearing surfaces, the wheel hub, and the axle splines. Anything ferrous that you put inside a blasting cabinet is going to rust quickly afterwards. The outer layer of impurities in the material typically slow the rust down, but once you remove that layer, it's just what happens. You have to deal. I don't want these things to be black, though. Rather than paint these, I'm just going to do the same thing we did to the struts, give them the old clear coat protection. And one of these hubs doesn't even match the other one, so I can tell that one of them was replaced at one point. Even the studs that came out of it were stamped differently, and that became very apparent once I got some bench grinder time to scuff off all the crust off the rest of this hardware. It took me about 10 minutes to clean all the fasteners up, and it was really nice to visit my home garage for the first time in a few months. All my time's been up at the shop lately, and all my tools are up here now, so... Anyway, I missed the shots of cleaning up and repainting the ABS rings. You're welcome. I painted these without masking anything, and I'm rather proud of myself for how it turned out. Very proud of you. The clear-coated hubs look amazing for their age. I just need to press in the eight-wheel studs and bolt the ABS rings back on here because the assembly's pressed into the hub bearing as the last step before bolting on the wheel. Starting with the studs, this is where you drop your sockets on the floor 300 times while rigging and pressing in on the eight studs. So if you ever get tired of bending over to pick up your sockets off the floor, just knock everything else on the floor right along with them. That way there's more stuff down there to make your efforts bending and picking it up more worthwhile. It just helps you to stay motivated. I didn't clear coat the outer rim of the ABS ring, and it's going to rust like this, but my plan is to clear coat all of this as an assembly once it's all back together. And there you have it. Both front hubs are now ready for bearings and grease. While those drives still got some rear strut purchase to clean up, and yes, that's my fly-ass CSM TV shirt, go watch and subscribe to that guy for more hilarious Colt and Gallant VR4 content. These strut mounts are getting the exact same treatment as all the front ones did, only the rear perches and mounts are welded together because they don't turn, so there's half as many of them for me to have to do. With these tools, the longest part of this process is waiting for paint to dry. The hardest part of the process is accepting that you suck at painting and have to repaint all the spots that you missed and then wait for them to dry a second time. But with that over with, I bought new dust boots for the struts because the front boots were just falling apart. These boots were definitely the right ones for the front once I figured out how they're supposed to be oriented and they're going to be a great fix. But these don't work at all on the rear struts. The hard way usually begins with not looking at your thing first. Always look at the thing. Because I didn't look at the thing, I'm just going to reuse my original boots because I couldn't find a KYB part number to replace these units with. And the other generic stuff that I can find doesn't work anything like what my struts actually need. The top of the boot perch is a big, thick, integrated washer that has a small hole to fit the strut shaft and transfer all the damping forces between the wheels and the strut perch. 
That washer is what does it all. The front ones don't have it, they rest against the bearing, but anyway, I'm cleaning these up with some soapy water and elbow grease. Not just the boots, I'm washing all the rubber stuff. Bushings, dampers, whatever. Soapy water's fine. No need for chemicals here. But something that I learned in college was that silicone oil wipes oxidized plastic and rubber right off effortlessly with a rag. It's the main ingredient in most plastic and trim restoration products, and while I don't have any pure silicone oil around, I do have some silicone spray lubricant, and with a little elbow grease, it's doing the exact same trick for me. You'll see that it's turning the paper towels black, so it's definitely working. It did a great job lifting the rust and dirt that was still left behind after the soapy water bath. The boots were pretty crusty and dented up before I started this, but I've managed to pop all those dents right back out and they actually look pretty nice. No cracks or holes. They're going to do the thing, and that's what I need. I need that. Another thing I need is to clean the old grease out of the front strut bearings that's most likely as old as these parts. Based on its chocolate pudding appearance, I'm sure that that's pretty accurate. I'm, I'm just replacing it with multi-purpose grease. This doesn't need to be anything fancy. It's only for steering anyway. I mean... I just pulled the springs out of the old spare set of gallant struts that I have and might as well buff those up too before we start assembling stuff. These are Robert's OTC spring compressors and they're mint, but they aren't very many coils for me to grab onto with these springs, making them a little bit tough to use here. You can't grab and compress the same number of coils on both sides, so it skews the spring sideways and that's why you saw the pry bar come out. But once you compress it far enough, you can line up the slot on the upper perch, align the big holes on both of the spring perches, tighten it all down, and take the spring compressor loose again. Put the grease cup cover back on, of course. I made that look easy, only because I struggled with the other one first off camera. So, now we're good. The rears get complicated. If you measure the length of the spring perch on the adjustable KYBs that are made for an Eclipse and not a Gallant, the spring perches are 13 inches. If you measure the gallant strut, the spring perch length is 12 and 5 8 inches. So the spring perch is 3 8 of an inch longer on the rear struts for an eclipse, which would lower its spring rate. The adjustable strut is about an eighth of an inch longer overall though. I'm just checking to see how many threads I've got to play with here on the end of the strut shaft, just to make sure this is going to actually leave me with some preload. Several of the comments from people with experience using these springs recommended cutting a coil off because it sits an inch higher on the rear after installation. Removing one coil shaves about 7 eighths of an inch off of the spring, raises its spring rate very slightly, and shouldn't leave me without spring preload. So let's cut them. After a quick test fit, just to be sure, let's go ahead and assemble these correctly, put the boots on, the spring on, the lower strut mount bushing on, line up the rubber spring damper first because it has a detent on the end of the spring. Once you line that up, you can line up the studs on the perch the way they're supposed to be oriented on the car, and then add the upper bushing, washer, and nut. You want everything lined up correctly before the nut goes on because once it's tight, you can't turn it. Loose springs could make loud clacking sounds on the bigger bumps, but it looks like I've got plenty of spring preload, so these shouldn't be noisy at all. And with that one out of the way, I just have to do that one more time, and another major portion of the subframes are all wrapped up. The struts aren't really a part of the subframe at all, it's just like how the brakes aren't part of the subframe, neither is ABS, the driveline parts, or even the steering. They're all their own things, but the subframe isn't just the thing that they're all attached and bolted to. It's the focal point of where all these things affect the chassis. That's why you see me having to touch all these individual components as part of a subframe restoration. I won't be able to test these cut springs out until the car's back together, and hopefully following the advice offered about them pans out. But we're done for these things for now. This is the big moment that I've been preparing for all along, right here. All right, I got an opportunity to go get my parts now, and uh, figured I'd uh, keep traditions alive. I stopped at Country Style Donuts, and there you go. If y'all don't know about this place, it's around Richmond, Virginia, in the Sandston area. It's on Williamsburg Road. They got the best donuts. If you're ever visiting this area, come pay them a visit. You won't regret it. But these are going to Justin. We're gonna go grab the powder coated stuff. Come on, people. Oh, and by the way, these uh, cake batter donut holes, these are for me. I didn't share those with you, Justin. 
I gave you the big box of donuts. These are really good too. One of the most important things I need to do besides showing appreciation to vendors is keep my audience entertained. So naturally that means petting shop dogs, for starters. You've met Talon here before. My project's success depends on how I feel about doing the work that makes it possible. And that work is never, not even for one single second, ever going to care about anyone's feelings. I haven't done any of the effort to lay down a perfect powder coated finish before myself, outside of opening my wallet. And there's absolutely no way I'm going to practice on a pile of rare, out-of-print, hard-to-replace historic artifacts here on YouTube so I can constantly criticize myself while editing it. I'm trying to get videos and cars done here. I want to build some truly great cars. And I'm well aware that there's good entertainment value when I struggle, but I can't do work like this. Certainly not the first time. But that's not the only reason I chose Detective Services. Their experience is an asset, but... This is just another one of the detective specialties. All these brakes were disassembled, completely rebuilt with new seals and hardware wherever necessary, greased, reassembled, and they're ready to put back to use. I've done it all before, but I didn't have to do any of it this time, and that takes care of another major component of the subframe assembly. We're way ahead of schedule now. Oh yes, all this certainly helps. I used the same exact factory red that's on the valve cover. Why red on a green car? Well, Gallant owners weren't typically the outwardly flashy sport compact crew, so this is a little weird. Red calipers I recall being controversial amongst many of the Gallant owners back in the day, but many of the green ones still ended up with this treatment anyway. All of the suspension upgrades in the 90s, including even the available bushing options, were mostly red. Many Gallant owners did do this treatment to their cars, not just to be fashionable with just about every other driving enthusiast on the road that was doing the same thing with every other make and model, but to match the rest of all the other stuff they'd already changed. It's like making your socks match your tie. My car already has half the red stuff on it, and you can watch me make this one work. Of course, black isn't green either. Most all the subframe parts were originally satin black or a low gloss black. I went with the gloss black on all the knuckles, trailing arms, cross members, and subframes because of its aquaphobic nature. It's true that gloss black shows dirt about the worst of any color, but the gloss is the least porous surface that will allow dirt to stick in the first place. But black is the correct original color for all of it, and it should be easier to clean. The parts are now completely and totally sealed from the elements except for some of the flanges where I have to press parts together or, you know, put some seals in. And it'll be permanently shielded from the effects of air, water, road salt, and other corrosive conditions. This coating is what turned this old steel into a forever part. Only one drawback, if I can call it that. No more brake cleaner allowed. Not on the assembly. You have to take it all the way apart first. Powder coating otherwise washes and wipes clean with soapy water. Quietly, off camera over the past month, all of the bearings and seals have arrived. I've got new front hub bearings, rear inner and outer axle seals, some random differential seal that I impulse bought because it had a unique part number that I hadn't encountered yet, brake shim kits, tie rods, Hold on, I'm not even done yet. Inner and outer front hub seals. And new inner and outer rear hub bearings as well. A lot of these parts I'll be replacing are good, but after going this deep into it, there's just no reason for it all not to be a full reset. We'll press all those parts in and start assembling subframe pieces in the next Gallant installment. I just wanted to give you this progress update because this one's come a long way in a short period of time. Absolutely none of the businesses that I mentioned in this video paid me for any of this. I'm just their customer and I have no problems with sharing all the good experiences and gratitude that your support enables me to have. The harder you click the like and subscribe buttons, the faster this one's next video is going to show up here. Thank you YouTube and Patreon. I'll be back again soon, so stay tubed.